thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this incredibly difficult topic to talk about because observing things that we have very limited observations of uh, made this very interesting to prepare. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take you from our giants to our rocks via some, I don't know, giant rocks maybe. Um, so I'm going to... Um, the Exoclimbs conference series really focuses around the two biggest questions that we have in astronomy related to planetary science. And it's how do stars and planets form? And is life unique to our planet? And we are discussing all of those things that we need to do that sit right between those two massive questions. So we've got to break it down a little bit more. What are the demographics of planets? How many different types of planets are out there? What are their radii? What are their masses? What kind of stars are they around? What are their atmospheres made of? How many are there? What are they made of? And can we make any links whatsoever between those to these big questions? Can we take the links that we've got of the demographics, the types of planets that are being formed, how they might be being formed, their atmospheric constituents that we can measure, hopefully with telescopes, can we take any of that information and pass it back between these two questions? And that's really fundamentally what we're trying to do. And I think you've seen many, many talks this week that are trying to do parts of that and putting the pieces together. So this is uh, the famous plot from Fulton et al. This is the 2017 one because I edited it and it was a much neater one to edit. Um, and um, we've got our rocks down in this end from our solar system. We've got moons in there as well, all things with atmospheres. We saw also in Sarah Hurst's talk that we've got Pluto's atmosphere as well. So we've got to consider even these smaller bodies. We've got our giants over here, these hydrogen helium dominated atmospheres. And we've got this big gap that we're seeing. We don't have the majority of planets that are being found in our galaxy, in our solar system to compare to. So there's this big middle ground that we need to try and understand. And we can look at this in terms of a blue screen. Um, we can look at this in terms of the planetary composition as well. And if we start looking at the atmospheres of those planets in our solar system and trying to understand what the atmospheres of those planets are made up of, you can see that we've got those hydrogen helium dominated atmospheres. We've got majority of elements are hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen in those giant planet atmospheres. And then in the smaller planets where we've got detailed information, so Venus and Earth, for example, we have that carbon, nitrogen, oxygen again, and we've got other trace gases in there. And I had to modify the Earth one here, so I'm sorry uh, that it's a, a little bit disordered, but I had to modify it because it was actually showing you uh, what the composition of the crust was. And I really was interested in the atmosphere because what's really important is we're measuring the atmospheres of these planets with our observations right now. We're measuring the atmospheric temperature, we're measuring the atmospheric composition. So it's really important to try and understand the solar system context for that. And Try and think about what the difference is here. We're losing our hydrogen and helium, and we're increasing the amount we have of this carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. They're not missing from the giant planets, but they're dominated by this hydrogen and helium. So we've got to see about what this transition between the two is. And this also comes down to a lot of the stuff that we've been seeing about the internal composition of these planets. Where is that boundary? What happens as we move from these Neptune mass worlds, which have these large ice contents in our solar system? What happens when we move to something more rock content? And how does that change what we're going to be observing? So we can use the solar system as a basis for trying to bridge these gaps. But it's really only in exoplanets that we're going to be able to uh, add all this together. I'm sorry, it's all keynote um, is, the, is the main issue. Don't get a new MacBook. They don't like to connect to old projectors. Um, so we've got these different things that we can see in our solar system, and we have these different theories where how that is being affected by the formation processes. This is just a cartoon that I made, which brings together a lot of different work about the ice lines, where a planet forms, and how that informs what the atmosphere might be made of. So the C to O ratio might inform us about where in the disk it formed beyond ice lines or interior to them. So rocky planets, we think, form all interior to those ice lines. 
How can we use the information we're measuring in the atmosphere to try and understand that? And the two different formation processes, which imprint themselves on the atmosphere differently. So we can look at the atmospheres of these planets and try and understand and see if we can work out how they formed and where they formed. And that can really help inform us about what that demographic of planets really means when we compare it to our solar system. And the big questions that come from this, when we're going towards these smaller planets, because this has really been focused around these giant planets, does this apply to those mini Neptunes? Does this apply to terrestrial planets at all? And at what mass radius of a planet do these formation markers start to break down? And we have to start asking different questions. And I think we've seen a lot of those questions this week. And we really need to be picking those apart. So I want to go back and look at the kind of contingent of planets that we've got. And this is a uh, kind of old now. It doesn't have a single test planet on it, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, it's a much easier way of showing it. I like showing this because it really shows that we are observationally biased away from our solar system right now. Our solar system is really sitting quite far away in this diagram, but I'm going to show other diagrams later where it's right in the mix of the types of planets that we're looking at. And you can see that that region I've cut off for the, the Neptune evaporation desert uh, or core erosion or many different kinds of heating which might lose your atmosphere that we've seen and I've highlighted the ones that we have well measured masses and radii and those are really important for any kind of characterization we're not just trying to observe these planets as a demographic we want to know more about them we need to know more about their atmospheres so we can start bridging the gap between those two big questions so we need the mass and the radii and that actually adds some complications because the masses are actually not easy to do for small planets. And this is some, some work that uh, Raphael Hayward shared with me, so I'd like to share it with you, that looking at the different aspects of noise that you get from a star, and this goes right down to the fundamental granulation, the circulation patterns in the star that you can see here, that adds noise to your radial velocity measurement. So when you're trying to measure the mass of a planet through the radial velocity method, you've got to consider all of the different noise parameters of the stars that you're looking at. And we really don't understand the stars enough. And that's one of the really big take homes when we're looking at small planets is we got to know the stars really well. But what Raphael's doing is using observations of the sun to try and understand and simulate how these might affect your radial velocity data so that you can take that out and we can actually get way more accurate measurements and understand the size of these planets a little bit better because that's so important and we need that mass it's essential to interpreting the atmosphere it is essential to know the mass when we look at a transmission spectrum emission spectrum of a planetary atmosphere and we've got a nice roadmap for radial velocities moving into the future this isn't just old stuff we're constantly building and applying new radial velocity measurements. And what you can see at the top there is some simulations of test yields and speculus yields. And those are just for the M stars. So these you can see on the side, very cold stars, these red stars. And we're going to be pushing in to the masses of these stars. And that's really good news for trying to understand and characterize these small planets. So in the future, we've got a number of instruments coming on board. We've got HARPS-3, which is uh, something that the UK is part of as well. That's be on La Palma. Uh, and we've got GCLEF coming up, which will uh, really help push us as far as we can down to these small Earth-sized worlds. So it's really important that we keep pushing. We keep pushing for radio velocity instruments and keep pushing for radio velocity measurements so we can get the masses of these systems where we might not be able to get transit timing variations from multiple planets. But it's not just the, the mass that we need. We need the transit. We need the size of the planet. And if we don't have the radius of the planet, we are still going to be reliant on those mass radius models to, to, to try and interpret a planet that we've discovered with other methods. So we might, if, we, if we've just got the mass, that's still not enough. We need both of these things. And we need to, in transit observations, get the stellar radii right 
so that we can get the planetary radii right. And this is a study done by Sam Morell at the University of Exeter that's just gone up uh, on the archive, where they show that the Gaia measurement, using the Gaia measurements, the previous radius measurements for many of the transiting exoplanet host stars are off by 10%. And they actually bring that measurement down uh, to an uncertainty of plus or minus 2.7%. So I recommend you go check out that paper and have a look. But the reason this is important is because we're trying to understand that big question, is life unique to our planet? We need to know about what the change is if we change the size. How does that affect whether something is habitable or not? How does that change that? We don't know if this is a linear trend. I doubt it mm -hmm. very much. I think it's the really squiggly one. And then each planet's going to give us a bit of a headache. So we've got to look at lots of them to try and understand this. So we need the mass and the radius. So I'm going to take you through some observations that we've done. I'm going to take you through nice and, nice and slowly, because um, I know this is quite a theory-heavy crowd. So let's start with putting all of those dark black dots on the mass radius diagram. Uh, you can see. Uh, I put some divisions up there as well. If we stick our solar system in there, you can see that we're actually capturing quite a nice range in there of our solar system. But again, remember that first figure. Our solar system's way off to the side, so the very different temperature regimes that we're talking about. And if we pick, pick your favorite models, pick any models, they all fill out this space somehow. There's a nice big blur of models that go through this space. I just picked these ones because they're very easy to, to plot on up there. We've got some of our solar system moons in there demonstrating how those lines uh, go through the mass radius relations of different compositions of planets. So the mass radius gives you nice density and we can get a bulk composition from that. And you can see that our Uranus and Neptune sit right in the middle of some of these models that I've put up here. And it's really the spread that I want you to focus on there in all of these regions. We've split it in terms of mass down the bottom here. We've got those nice lines which tell you what kind of mass box we want to put you in. Do you want, are you a super Earth, a mini Neptune, a Neptune, a Saturn? That's your mass box. But the spread in radii across that is quite vast. And how does that affect? how we're defining these planets, and what that actually means for what types of worlds these are that we're looking at. So I'm going to take you through some of them. I'm going to take you through uh, planets from our Neptune regime, where we've got some nice measurements of their atmospheres, down to our terrestrial regime, where things get a little bit more tricky, um, and it gives observers a little bit of a headache when we get the data. So starting with our nice, beautiful hydrogen-dominated atmosphere, big signals, lots of photons coming, streaming through the atmosphere, absorbed by the atmosphere and telling us what is in that atmosphere. We've got the largest one that I'm going to talk about, uh, HAT26 up the top there, really nice, clean, clear water absorption feature. We can get an understanding of the abundance of water in the atmosphere of that planet. And as you go down, as you go through, and you can see it's labeled really nicely, uh, thanks to Ian Crossfield and Laura Kreiberg in terms of temperature. As we go down and we get colder, we get flatter and flatter the transmission spectra. And what is happening there? What is causing this? Is it that the planets don't have atmospheres, even though we, we know that they're gonna be hydrogen and helium dominated? It's not the case. So there's got to be opacity sources in there that are causing problems. And we heard some things about the hazes that will be causing problems there, so photochemically generated materials, and also about clouds. And, and Jonathan Fortney told us that if we increase the internal temperature of these planets, those clouds are going to be a bit more pesky. So we've got to really try and understand the dynamics internal to these atmospheres to really pick them apart. As we... I'm going to take you through two of the ones at the bottom here. Uh, first, I want to look at this Uranus mass planet. Um, and we got a nice talk from Bjorn earlier in the week looking at this new results that it shows at the top here. We've got that water absorption feature there. And then this is the, the original data that was taken back in, in 2013, 2014, when this planet was first discovered. And 
I, I'm going to show this. This is going to be on all of the slides for the, for the next couple uh, of, of minutes. And I'm going to move down this mass range. And it's really important to note each of these radii and mass. Because we're going to jump around a bit, but it's going to completely change what kind of planet that we're looking at. So I want you want keep note of that. But what's really, and Beyond pointed this out, important here is at 600 Kelvin, we fully expect this to have methane in the atmosphere. This is the chemical equilibrium diagram which says we should see methane in these cooler atmospheres, and we're just not. We're not seeing it. Uh, and we haven't seen it in giant planet atmospheres where it's even easier to detect. We haven't seen it in small planets. We haven't seen it in any of the planets that we've tried to look for. So this where's the methane question is a massive one in trying to understand the composition of these planetary atmospheres and what's happening chemically and dynamically in those atmospheres, which mean that we're not seeing it. And that's a big, important question we're going to have to be answering in the coming years. And I'm hoping that James Webb's going to help us with that. But another really interesting thing, one of the things I really love about this planet is that, in fact, it is drastically losing its mass. Uh, work that was published earlier this year by Vincent Bourrier from the PANSET program, so the Panchromatic Hubble Treasury program that's led by David Singh and uh, Mercedes Lopez Morales, observed the Lyman Alpha of this planet. And we heard about Lyman Alpha lines uh, earlier this week, so that was a nice introduction for you. And what they saw was that this planet is losing a significant amount of its atmosphere and very quickly. It is not a particularly old system, and it seems like we're seeing it in the first stages of it losing that dominant hydrogen helium atmosphere. We heard from James Owen's talk that there is uh, two kind of links. If you got extreme X-ray UV radiation, we expect that will be the main driver of mass loss in the early years of a planet as it forms. And then the softer radiation will be causing mass loss after that. We're seeing extreme UV radiation mass loss from this planet. It's going to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's then the question of how that changes the atmospheric composition. And if that's something that means that we can no longer trace it back to what size it started at. Can we ever know how big this planet started out as? That's a really important question. And how long can a planet live like this? And at what end state will we see it in? I don't know how many million years we're going to be alive for, but um, if we could, what would it end up as? And it's really down to simulations matching with what we're seeing observationally that is required to try and really fully understand these worlds. So it's a link between both theory and observations. As we move down to the most famous of the planets, uh, this is a very cloudy atmosphere that was measured uh, by a number of people. And then, you know, finally, the, the nail in the coffin from Laura Kreiberg, uh, 60 observations with Hubble to get the most precise flat line that's ever been measured with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, it's very beautiful. And what this really, really showed was that this atmosphere has an opacity source that is really obscuring any molecular features that we're seeing there. And that's something that we're going to have to deal with. But it also tells us, as we saw earlier this week, very nicely pointed out, something about the dynamics of this atmosphere. If you have opacity particles in the atmosphere that are causing this, they have to be held at that altitude. There has to be dynamical movement to maintain them. They're not being destroyed by the stellar radiation. So they're either being recreated and there's a recycling mechanism or they're forming there and they're staying there. So we're learning a little bit about the dynamics there. But one thing that I want to, to really point out, please stop calling it a super earth. Pretty please. If we look at some of the models from uh, Lopez and Fortney, and they've got a lot of really nice figures in this paper, I really encourage you to, to go check it out. And we look at the radius and the mass of this planet, there is no way it cannot have a hydrogen helium envelope around it and mass dominated by that envelope. And if a mass, 
let's talk about definitions. Definitions are like humans want to define things. We're horrible creatures like that. We want a very specific definition. There isn't one in science and none of these planets are going to agree with us. But if something is dominated in mass by its atmosphere, as we see with our giant planets, mini Neptune, if it's dominated in mass by its core, by rock, by anything else, then sure, go call it a super Earth. But I really think it's important that we, we don't add uh, labels to things that are a little bit misleading. And this has got a fantastically large atmosphere that we can look at. So there's lots of different ways that we can do that. And I think that it really sits within that hydrogen helium dominated regime. But we just don't know. We need to, we need to look at these worlds. That leads me on to something else that we've covered. So I'm really glad that I'm actually at the end. I was very nervous about that at first, but everyone else has given a really great introduction to all of these things, so I don't have to go into too much detail. We have our lava worlds, and we've got quite a few of them in this regime where we've measured their radii and their mass. One of the most famous ones is 55 Cancri E, and there's a lot of questions that we need to ask about this. If we look again at that Lopez and Fortney diagram, it should have an atmosphere of roughly 30% hydrogen and helium. But we know it can't because it's so hot. It's so hot, it cannot have that kind of atmosphere. So this is just me pointing out that we can't just rely on those two parameters. I started out by going through, we need the mass, we need the radius. We also need to know the temperature. We need to know the stellar radiance. We need to know what kind of star it's around. There's a huge amount of information that we need about each of these individual worlds so that we can look at them collectively. And this is a really prime example of that. Some of the first observations that were done at 55 Cancri were looking for this large dominant atmosphere around this world. And actually, one of the most important things that's been seen is variations in this planet's atmosphere. So, I had a couple of questions when Laura was giving her talk. You know, if we're looking at variations in this planetary atmosphere, if we're seeing differences, changes, are we talking about catastrophic outgassing where it's bursting and it's random? Or are we talking about continuous outgassing from this lava lake, this possibly eyeball lava magma ocean, where it's just changing the types of material that are being released from that magma? And these are questions that we don't know the answer to. And we need to be observing what the specific materials of those are. And there's two fantastic posters which show that it's not any of these. Um, so sorry, spoiler, uh, it's not HCN being observed there and there's not evidence of the sodium and the calcium as well. So what is being released from this large magma ocean and how is that being recirculated around the planet? We're seeing strong phase curves, so therefore there's recirculation of heat, what, what does that mean? How is that doing it? And when we saw really nice examples in Laura's talk about how you might expect the time scales of some rain out being closer to the edge of the magma ocean and therefore going under and being recirculated sub, uh, subsurface on the night side. So these are really big questions that we don't have the answers to. And that's what we need to do is to understand them by looking both in emission uh, phase curves and in seeing if we can get any kind of absorption features. There's another lava world, which again does not fit at all with this program because it's also too hot, but it's actually a lot cooler than 55 Cancri E. It's about 500 to 700 Kelvin cooler than 55 Cancri E, but it is still too hot to maintain any atmosphere, even if it was big enough for it, and we know that it's not. The question we have here for Coro 7, is it a stripped core? If it is a stripped core, how big was it to start with? When did it lose its atmosphere? And how quickly did it lose its atmosphere? It's very similar questions that we have to Venus's atmosphere. When did it lose its water? How quickly did it lose its water? These questions aren't new. None of the questions we're asking in exoplanet science are particularly new. Our solar system has given us a plethora of ridiculous questions over the years that we've had to go and answer. And the beauty of exoplanets is we have thousands of them to answer those questions with. So we need to be looking across a wide diversity of planets and trying to observationally differentiate between these two different kinds of worlds 
is really important. So my questions to you, these aren't questions I'm going to answer. That would be completely ridiculous. I'm an observer, not a theorist. My questions to you are, how do we answer them? How can you provide observers with different things that we can look for to prove or disprove different models? That's so important as we move into a, a far more data-rich era, is having things that we can prove and disprove, places we can look and actually make those measurements for you. So please think about all of these things. I'm going to end our journey across the mass radius diagram at the most famous of the planets, the Trappist-1 system. We got a bit of an introduction to them earlier. These are two of my favorite figures of the Trappist-1 system. There's so many papers on them, but uh, the, the Delrez paper has these two beautiful figures which show all of the seven planets and the angle they subtend on the star, which is just really, really useful information for an observer. This is the angle all of the planets subtend on the star. And that is something that is invaluable, and I'll explain why in a second. We've also got the uh, nice comparison to Earth and Venus here. We're looking at seven planets that all sit within the terrestrial realm. And I use the word terrestrial not to mean Earth-like, because that's a silly word. I mean they are dominated by rock of some kind, and we want to find out what. We also want to find out if they've got an atmosphere. We've ruled out with Hubble Space Telescope observations a primordial hydrogen and helium atmosphere around B through G. Our observations of H haven't come in yet, but when they do, I will let you know. But the real question uh, is, the real answer is we don't know. <laughs> We got no clue. We ruled out a uh, primordial envelope of hydrogen and helium. We've got no idea if there's anything underneath that. We've got no current idea of if it's got an atmosphere dominated by CO2, N2. We're never going to find out if it's N2. Uh, if it's just a bowling ball. But we're going to look. Are any of these habitable? We don't know. Uh, and can... We use these worlds to disentangle the impact of stellar radiation. This is my favorite thing about this gold mine. We have seven planets, different distances from the same star, all roughly the same mass density that we can use to try and understand how a star affects a planet's atmosphere. And that's what we intend to do with this system more than anything else. Don't talk to the astrobiologists. They want to look for life. I want to know how a star is affecting a planetary atmosphere at various distances, and this is a great place to start looking for that. And in the future, we're getting a lot more planets. This is just the calculation of the test yield. It's based on Barclay Hill. I just made it into uh, more me colors. Um, and you can see we're getting lots of M, M star planets down here as well, and we've got Speculus coming online as well, and that radial velocity diagram I showed you showed you all of the types of planets that we expect to find around those. So we really need to understand this type of system. And honestly, Trappist has given us the ability to do that. Um, so I'm going to take you through some work that I've just recently done looking at the Trappist-1 system and trying to learn how we can disentangle the planetary atmosphere from that of a annoying little cold star. I don't know how many stellar physicists we've got in the room that I can annoy um, with this. So the Trappist-1 system, again, a nice little introduction. Here is the, the analysis that we've done to rule out those hydrogen-helium envelopes around these planets. And we had some very tentative evidence here for Trappist-1g. So what we did is we went back and we got more observations of Trappist-1g. So I'm going to take you through a case study on that. But first, the reason why we need to care about this Trappist-1 is a very cool M star. It's 2,500 Kelvin. That means that it itself has water vapor in its atmosphere. So the star itself has absorption and emission features due to water vapor in the atmosphere. And that is exactly what we're looking for in the planet's atmosphere. So we have to understand that water absorption in the star to really understand what we're seeing in that planetary atmosphere. And it's really important where in the atmosphere of the star there are different features. So if you've got a spot, either cool or hot, on that star, it's going to be a different temperature. It's going to have different spectral features. 
how can we try and understand what different structures there are on the star itself and how they're changing the spectral features of the star. Uh, ben Rackham uh, in 2018 started a study looking at what, what he dubbed the uh, transit light source effect. Um, I like to think of it more of a flux contrast, um, but that's because I've been hanging out with solar physicists too long. But the, the light source effect is really looking at how these different features based on hot spots, cold spots, on a cold star which already has a base absorption of water, change what we're measuring in the transit depth. And the transit depth, as a function of wavelength, is what's giving us the planetary spectrum. And if that's changing with the star as well, we need to understand that and we need to remove that stellar effect. So I'm going to take you through what I've done to try and remove that stellar effect. And this is a lot based on the Rackham papers and the equations that they had in there. So first, just to look at what that might, might do, you can see your observed spectrum in green here, and then the true planetary spectrum without the imprints of the star on it in blue there. So that's what we're trying to get to. And the way that we do that is we take simply the measured transit depth, and that is equal to a contrast factor of the star. So how different is the star to a real planetary spectrum? <laughs> So we can calculate what this contrast factor is by modeling what the flux of the star is and taking it as different components. And what we're doing here is we're taking three temperature components of the star. So we're saying you've got a base photosphere, that is one temperature, and you might have cool spots or hot spots, so two different types of temperatures on that base photospheric temperature. And we're trying to calculate how much area on the star each of those temperatures are represented by. So you can then calculate what this factor is. You need to multiply by your, well, divide your measured spectrum by to get your real spectrum. And the way that we did that with TRAPPIST-1 is we've got a huge number of observations of this planet out of transit. So out of transit, no planets in front of the star. This is just the star and what it looks like. And we took all of those observations that we had, and we created an average template of that star for this particular observation. And we fit different models to it, and we fit three different temperature component models to that star. And we found we allowed them to vary in terms of the temperature that they wanted, the fraction that they covered. And we created an entire grid of different temperatures and combination factors that we could do to find out what this star might look like. And what we, what we found was that with these three different temperatures, sorry, this is a bit dense, but for the three different temperatures, you end up with a single temperature model where your planet's passing in front just a boring, quiet star of the same temperature. Two temperatures where your planet passes in front of a mixture of hot, cool regions. It passes just in front of the cool photosphere, and it passes just in front of the hot bit. And then again, that same kind of combinations for the three temperature model. And then you have, it could pass in front of a cold and medium mix. It can pass in front of a cold, hot mix, hot, medium mix, all of that. And what you can do by looking at these fractions and taking you know, logical steps through this is you can start ruling things out. Based on the stellar models and based on the fit to the observations that we got, we were able to rule out the one temperature model. This did not fit the, at what we were measuring from the star at all. We're then able to look at the different things that we've got here. We can use the geometry of this to rule things out. And it's really nice when you think about it logically. You have a hot region in your two temperature model, which covers 3.5% of the star's surface. As our planet transits that star, it's not, it would need to only cover a stripe of hot atmosphere around that star on its transit, not go anywhere near any cool bits. So that would mean that the star would have a stripe of hot around it. And that is according to all of the stellar physicists I talked to, completely unrealistic. So we can rule that one out. We can also rule out this hot model here as well. And we can rule out the medium model for a very similar reason. So we've already been able to rule out a huge number of this parameter space. 
So we can start digging down and trying to understand, okay, what's left? What are the possibilities that are left? This planet is passing in front of a mixture of different temperature regions. It's evenly distributed across the stellar surface, or there's kind of some spots in there that are nice and small that we don't see in the transit light curves. We're not seeing any evidence whatsoever of spot occultation. And we can start ruling these out. And we do that by taking that equation. We take our measured transmission spectrum. We calculate the contrast factors for each of those combinations. These are what the correction factors should be. And you end up with a series of five different potential transmission spectra for what this planetary atmosphere should look like. So we've got five different potential planetary transmission spectra. So now let's take some more logical steps, which we're going to take the first logical step of saying that this planet could not have an atmosphere greater than scale height, five scale heights here. And we know that because then we would measure it to be a mini Neptune and it's very much got a mass and density of an Earth-sized world. So we're actually only left with two. We're left with the green one, which is actually our original measurement. So the measured transmission spectrum is equal to the real transmission spectrum of the planet. And the purple one, which suggests that the planet is, the star is represented by three different temperatures and that the planet is passing in front of a mixture of the cool and medium temperatures in that model. And we can look at each of those in turn and we can start now by being planetary scientists. So we've gone from stellar physicists uh, to uh, mathematicians and geographers essentially to planetary scientists finally. Um, we were using models which were created by Sarah Moran, and you can go find and talk to her. She uh, presented a poster earlier this week, but please go and chat about the models that she made for us. These are based on the data that comes from the, the horse lab, and using the information from that, she created a series of models for all of the Trappist planets. And you can see this in, in her paper in 2018. All of the different Trappist planets for both photochemically generated species, so these hate particles, and these different cloud particles, how might they affect what transmission spectra you're getting? How might they change what you're going to be measuring? So using those different models that she created for us, we looked at each of these transmission spectra. And what we were able to find was that there is only one possibility that is reasonable for this planetary configuration. That the measured transmission spectrum of TRAPPIST-1G is the real transmission spectrum of TRAPPIST-1G. And that means that we're not getting this contrast effect. We're not measuring differences on the star. And that's really great here. That would be really nice. It makes our life simpler to make that assumption. But what I'm saying is we can't make that assumption. We do have to go through this grueling process of analyzing each of these types of planets around these M stars, these cool stars, through a step-by-step -step process to rule out the presence of stellar features on the measured transmission spectrum. So it's going to be a little bit grueling for everybody when we're doing this, but it's so important so that when we're using our models, we can know that we're looking at what the planet is giving us and not what the star is giving us. So I'm just going to show you what those logical steps are just so that you've got them written down. Please take a picture or go look at the paper. Um, you need to measure the stellar spectrum out of transit. You need to have an understanding of over a fairly decent amount of time what this star looks like. If you're going to fit the models to it, the models aren't perfect. The models are actually quite wrong in some cases. You need to make sure that you're fitting multiple different models and you are scaling them to the correct unit. The units are hugely important here. Please go read the paper to work out why the units are hugely important here. Um, do not inflate the uncertainties on your data. Um, so units are hugely important. Use the geometry, use the logic. Where is this planet passing in front of its star? Could you have just a stripe of hotspot? Is the spot that you would expect, the fractional coverage big enough that you might expect an occultation event? If you don't see one, you can actually put a limit on the sizes of the spots on the atmosphere. And we actually do that for this Trappist-1 planet as well. And then use those corrected models to your different measured and potentially real planetary transmission spectra with theoretical models to try and understand which ones 
might be might be real. And in fact, I will let you know that we didn't know the difference between the two of them until we looked out to the Spitzer data point as well. So you can't just correct the data you've got. Use all the data on that planet and use the correction factor over the right wavelength ranges to correct it and try and understand those planetary atmospheres. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour through the problems that we have with terrestrial planets, but also the, the amazing array of different types of worlds that we've got. And the question is, where do we go from here? Um, I'm not going to just focus on web, but I do like the awful pun. Um, we have in the future a huge number of missions at our disposal. And that is going to really, really drive exoplanets forward. This is a new field, maybe not anymore, but it's going to get wilder, it's going to get more difficult, and there's going to be way more data than we've ever known how to handle before. So we're going to scare the crap out of the theorists for a bit. So get ready, because <laughs> we're excited for it. Um, so we've currently got lots of really nice missions going on. I didn't list them all here. We've got TESS, which is really churning out planets. I haven't talked about any of them here, uh, but there are tons of them. And if you were following along with the TESS science conference uh, a week or so ago, then you had seen loads of stuff. And if you're extreme solar systems next week, you will see even more stuff coming out from those TESS planets, some characterization stuff as well. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we've got James Webb launching. We've got... GCLEV coming online, which would be great. And we've got all of these different types of instruments which are going to help us characterize these very small worlds, really pushing down to these small worlds. And I wouldn't be doing my job uh, from Space Telescope if I didn't remind you that in the next year, you have a lot of work to do. Um, we have two proposal deadlines that we really focus on here in exoplanets coming up. We've got the HSC 28 cycle. That call will go out in November. You will then need your proposals in by March 1st. It's earlier than normal. The call for proposals for James Webb will be going out in January sometime, and then your proposals will be due in May, just two months after your Hubble proposals. So get writing now. Um, please, seriously, don't leave it to the last minute. It really stresses me out. But it's not just the Cycle 1 proposals. We already know that James Webb is going to be looking at loads of small planets. In fact, almost half of the GTO time that is dedicated to exoplanets, which is 27% of all of the GTO time, we're really crushing it as a field and making the cosmologists very angry at us, uh, which I hear far too often, that we've got roughly half of these are actually smaller planets. Um, and I'm... Defining smaller here, coming from the, the WASP-107, which is actually a fairly large world, uh, very nicely inflated. We're going to get lots of photons from that one. That one's going to be nice uh, observations down through to that TRAPPIST-1 system that I showed you. So we're getting GTO guaranteed observations of all of these different worlds. And the black dots up here represent the, the larger planets that we'll be looking at. And I put in brackets over here, whether it's a transit or eclipse, so we're getting a mixture of transit observations, which are the ones that I've been showing you today. I've really been only showing you the transmission spectrum, the absorption spectrum of these planetary atmospheres if they have one. But emission is so important for trying to understand the temperature structure. If they have an atmosphere, what's the temperature structure? If they don't, can we get any kind of measurement from the surface at all? And we've got lots of eclipse measurements and a phase curve up here as well for some of these smaller ones. This uh, is because I couldn't find the mass of this planet or this planet, so I'm not really sure where they lie, but I will definitely update it once uh, I have better numbers on those. And just to give you an idea of what those James Webb observations might look like, here's a very complicated slide. Uh, so on the top, we're seeing some transmission spectra, uh, simulations, these are from Tasha Battaglia. And you can see various different combinations of gases and what we might see for this planetary atmosphere. This is the most uh, kind of optimistic version of the transmission spectrum we will be measuring with the GTO program, which is led by Nicole Lewis. Um, we will be getting four 
full transit observations of TRAPPIST 1E with the prism which will allow us to get the full spectrum from 0.6 out to five microns in one shot. And we'll be getting four of those to get this uncertainty compared to what we measured with Hubble with two. So you can see we're going to learn something, even if it's a bowling ball. We'll learn that it's a very precise bowling ball. Um, so this is really, really exciting. And then we heard a little bit earlier, but Caroline Morley's done an excellent paper in 2017, looking through at the different simulations that you can get, and really importantly, looking at the thermal component, looking at the emission of these planets. And in fact, out of the GTO program, the TRAPPIST-1 planets are only looked at an emission for TRAPPIST-1b. So if you want to put in any proposals to look at any of the other planets in emission, please do. Please put those proposals in, lead that charge, trying to get the information there. And then some recent work, which we've got on some very nice posters. Please go out and talk to them, uh, which just came out on archive, like they said, where we're looking at how the emission can be measured for these planets and what that tells us. That's the most important thing. What does that tell us? We've got the models, uh, which come from Malik, and we've got the observational constraints that we might be able to get from Mansfield. So please go and see those posters in any time that you have and, and have a chat to them because this is so important. We need to predict and we need to simulate these observations so that we can try and understand these worlds. And just to put this in context, I normally work on giant planets because I'm lazy. Um, this is much, much easier to measure. This is much easier to measure. It's very nice to see when you do a data analysis and this big, massive water bump comes out. It's beautiful. This is the scale of that very, very optimistic TRAPPIST-1E transmission spectrum I just showed you. But to still put that in context, the uncertainties on that were tiny. We can measure this with James Webb. We can measure the relative difference between this massive feature, which, to be honest, we're going to get in such good detail. I'm very excited about that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Me thing. Um, but we can do this. We can measure these with James Webb. So we've got really big questions. Compared to hot Jupiters, it's not impossible. I hope I've convinced you of that. We need multi-cycle programs to really push this field to smaller planets. We need multi-cycle programs which go back and look at these planets. And that's got to be a coordinated effort. This has got to be a coordinated effort across the community. Can Think about when you're writing your proposals or thinking about the models that you're going to be running. Can any of the current GTO programs, can any of the current observations that we'll be getting guarantee help with that? Can they help with your proposal? Can they help really push forward what you want to be doing? We need to understand what the noise is associated with this. We saw some, some talks where we can learn about the noise. The noise is important. It really restricts what we can do. Where is the noise for on this and how does that limit us? And that's something we're going to learn when we're on sky. So make sure you're keeping that in mind when you upgrade your models later on. And can we get phase curves of non-transiting planets? Really think about that. That's a really important one when we're talking about the temperature structure. It's not just the transiting planets here in terms of that characterization. If we want to try and understand these lava worlds a little bit more, is there a non-transiting one that we can use? So I think that there's a lot of combinations of things across the community that we can do. And it's really moving further forward onto that timeline that I showed you, into that era of the giant telescopes, the extremely large telescopes, and looking at both the reflected and the thermal from these planets, we need to be looking in the optical. Hubble is not dead. Hubble is still kicking around. Um, please use it to look in the optical. We need the optical measurements. And the ELTs on the ground are going to do a fantastic job of looking at reflected light from both, you know, directly imaged planets as well, which is going to teach us a lot. Try and understand how they fit into those mass radius relations. And if we can really refine those measurements, we can possibly estimate a good radius on them. Only the ELTs can realistically get both of these. And we need to make sure that we're not just focusing on these space-based kind of transmission studies. We need to be looking towards what we can do to combine the phase space. Where's the overlap between transiting planets and direct image planets? Can we use that? One of the things that I think is really interesting to consider is the, the friends of hot Jupiters or the, the small 
transiting planets that we have, and there's an, a radial velocity planet further out. Can we use the ELTs to look at planets where we've got an inner transiting planet and an outer radial velocity planet? Can we use that to understand each of them in turn and how they might have evolved over time? And obviously looking even further into the future, it doesn't even fit anywhere near that timeline. We're talking about um, currently at NASA is asking for information on these three really benchmark missions, the origins, which will be a uh, transiting kind of based exoplanet mission. We've got HABEX, uh, which will be looking at mostly directly imaged planets and Louvois, which uh, will do whatever it can do with the biggest mirror it can possibly build in space without breaking the budget of the entire world. So there's a number of people here that can talk to you about that. Please go find them and, and chat about those missions. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not, not an expert on that. But we do have a poster um, uh, by, by Ty, um, and he can tell you a lot about Habex, um, and I definitely cannot, so direct your questions to him. But I, I want to leave you with this horribleness these are our outstanding questions. These are just some of the outstanding questions. I think this week we've seen lots and lots of outstanding questions that we need to answer as a community. And it really starts from more of the giant planets where we're trying to look at those formation markers. Can we use the C2 ratio, the metallicity of these hydrogen helium dominated atmospheres? Where does that break down? Where does the hydrogen helium limit of these planets break down? What makes up the atmospheres? Where is that methane? Can we use Webb in the 3.3 micron region where it's more dominant and we should be able to see it to really search for those signatures? That's going to be really interesting for us to try and understand the dynamical and chemical nature of these planets. Do the Trappist planets even have an atmosphere? For a number of them, we will, we will be able to answer that. And I'm not sure what happens when we do, so get your models ready. Um, how can we classify them? And is it important that we classify them? How important are those classifications in terms of understanding the demographic of planets out there? We want to understand how likely it is for a solar system to form. How likely is it to have a system without a super Earth or mini Neptune? We've got this gap. Everyone else seems to have one. Why don't we? How can we try and understand what these planets are made of to really fill in the information we're missing from our solar system? And then another thing I really want you to think about, because I want to break these. I don't want them to be fundamental limits, but these are the ones that I came up with as fundamental limits. <laughs> and I hope that they're not. So we need to work out how we can break these as we, much as we possibly can. Stellar granulation is going to be a problem. We don't know the stars as well as we think we know them. We need to know what these stars are doing. Is there a perfect target? People keep saying, if we find the perfect target, we'll be able to do this, that, and the other. What's the perfect target? Where am I looking for this perfect target? What does it consist of? How do you know it's a perfect target until you've looked at it? It's an absolute nightmare of a phrase, and it's a real fundamental limit for a lot of the models that I'm seeing. And I'm just like, what's the perfect target? What do you want? What do you need to see? And how can we most efficiently find that perfect target? And time. Time is a fundamental limit for us all. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll leave it there. <laughs> oh, a lot of questions. Oh, no. <laughs> it's okay, we have some time. There's a couple in the front, there's one over here, there's one in the middle, I think. Uh, they all went up at once. Whoever you can get to is fine. Just quickly, yeah. You. Just give That's it to the behind you guys. <laughs> okay, um, you mentioned GTO, and it sounded like that means something about guaranteed. Yes. Could you say uh, what the acronym is, what it, what it means, and uh, what fraction of whatever is guaranteed, what non-guaranteed is? And on previous missions like Kepler and, um, and Hubble, what observations came from guaranteed and what came from non-guaranteed? That's a, that's a great question. Sorry, I didn't explain that a little bit more. So guaranteed time for the James Webb Space Telescope is given a long time ago to instrument teams, engineers, um, and support institutions, which have supported the development and uh, implementation of the telescope from, I think, the James Webb ones date back to about 30, 40 years. 
So guaranteed time is assigned in the, the first year uh, of the telescope's operation to various teams who have worked on that telescope or supported that telescope. Now, this happened with the Hubble Space Telescope as well. When Hubble launched in 1990, there weren't exoplanets to look at. Uh, there was no exoplanet studies that were done specifically on the Hubble Space Telescope as part of guaranteed time assigned to those people that worked on it. The Hubble Space Telescope observations really started kicking in in the 90s, the mid-90s, um, and actually we didn't know that they had made exoplanet observations until the early 2000s when someone reanalyzed the data. So there's a lot of things that we can do now with the James Webb Space Telescope that we were never, ever able to do with the, James Webb, uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Also, a number of the instruments and many of the modes that we'll be using are designed specifically for us now. Um, we can really use that information to push forward the data analysis era of exoplanets. There is still, after the GTO time, there's ERS, early release science time, and the Transing Exoplanet community has the biggest, beautifulest chunk of that time. And they will be looking at the full transmission spectrum of a hot Jupiter. They will be doing the phase curve of, I believe, WASP-43b in the infrared with MIRI's instrument. And they will be doing, trying to test that fundamental limit of the noise floor of James Webb with a really bright target, really pushing the limits to try and understand the noise floor of the instrument itself. So those programs, the GTO programs, are private programs, and they will have proprietary time for a year. The ERS program is open to everybody. And we encourage every single one of you to join the ERS team. Join us. We need your help. We want your help. Uh, and we want to get as many people as possible involved in the community in the, the James Webb time that we will get so that we can understand the instrument. Now, the other time is guest observer time. So guest observer time is anything that you want to propose for. And the way that it's going to work is it's going to respond to proposal pressure. So the more you ask, the more proposals you put in, the more the community is going to get out. Now, I can't guarantee for a single person, if you put 50 in, you're going to get a proportional amount out from that. I can't guarantee that. But the community as a whole will be getting as much out as it pushes, pushes pressure on the proposals to get that time. And as I, as I said, with the GTO time, actually out of the 100% of GTO time, 27% is going to exoplanet. And... That would never, ever have been thought of before. It wasn't thought of at all when the GTO time was first assigned. So that's really exciting for the field. For the whole first year, just this no, 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 not at all, not at all. There's tons of guest observer time in, in the first year. This is a very small fraction of that, very small fraction of that first year. There is going to be a huge amount of time for the community. And in January, where you hear the call, you will hear exactly how many hours they are assigning in that first year to the community. All right, uh, in the front. Can you, oh, you already have it, John. Uh, oh. Sorry, Jonathan Fortney, UC Santa oh. Cruz. Um, I was, in terms of knowing thy star, I was really taken by the, this, for, this, for the Trappist parent star that you found a, a, t uh, a tiny filling fraction of extremely hot material, like 5,800 degrees, but like 1% of the star. Is that fairly robust? And because if, if that ends up being true for the M dwarfs, typically, I think that's a really interesting finding about the stars themselves, that these faculae or something would be so hot. Yeah, I had exactly the same question when we did the analysis. So the analysis was actually, I actually say thank you to my team. It was a huge team of people. We had uh, stellar physicists who were working a lot on that side of things. We had planetary scientists and we had observers and theorists working on all aspects of this. So it was a massive team effort. In terms of that really hot, portion of the star, it seems like, yes, according to the star physicists, it is, it is possible to have that. Uh, the mechanism for that and why you would see it on a photospheric level is very interesting. And um, I do not know, but I know exactly who to point you to. Um, please have a discussion with Jeff Valenti. He's always very entertaining to explain why Trappist is, is so interesting. Um, but there's another, there's another paper and another project done by Brett Morris, who also looked at the Trappist uh, one star and found that it's plausible um, that there is this incredibly hot, uh, and they suggest it's magnetically active hotspot on the star. So this is not just us that's, that's found that, that best fit to the star as well. Okay, one more. Hey, um, I have a, a comment and a question. The first, a comment. 
uh, just to come back on Trappist and and what we saw in the in the transit, uh, to be exact, it's not a hydrogen atmosphere that is rolled out. It's a cloud-free hydrogen atmosphere. I think we we still have to you know uh, have the JD twelve fourteen man. So and I so I recommend there brands for for some of the planets we can rule out a lot more, and for some of them, yeah, we can't rule out a fair amount at all. The the and observations we've got just aren't precise enough yeah, no, so but for, but for some of them i really recommend reading that paper there's some really great figures in there that will show you exactly what kinds of combinations of cloud haze uh, and hydrogen helium percentage we can rule out for those okay and for the the question is um I, i've seen going around a, a letter to stsci about maybe a servicing mission to hubble or white or white paper yes yeah, it's a white uh, paper. Uh, uh, do you think there is any chance that this can fly? I do not speak officially for Space Telescope in and, that capacity. And, <laughs> and unofficially? Unofficially, yeah. God damn it. We need new gyros. Get it up there. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, we're out of time. So let's give Hannah another round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>